Negroes not only have to be uh, re-educated to the importance of supporting black business, but the black man himself has to be uh, made aware of the importance of going into business. And once you and I go into business, we own and operate at least the businesses in our community, what we will be doing is developing a situation wherein we will actually be able to create employment for the people in the community. And once you can create some, I mean, some employment in the community where you live, it will eliminate the necessity of you and me having to act ignorantly and disgracefully boycotting and picketing someplace else trying to dig him for a job. Today's episode is brought to you by the Federation of African Canadian Economics. FACE is an historical movement co-founded by black Canadian visionaries empowering generational wealth creation while fostering black change makers. If you are a black entrepreneur or no one that could use an affordable loan of up to 250000 this is the movement for you. Check out www.facecoalition.com. I would like to welcome all our listeners to TOC Podcast. TOC stands for The Other Canada Podcast the show that is anchored in the undeniable fact that the Canada's historical and current lens is homogenous at best and filled with gaps that we aim to bridge. The space where we courageously explore BIPOC voices like you've never heard them before. At TOC Podcast, we pride ourselves in presenting to you black, brown, indigenous, and non-BIPOC individuals that have decided to move from allies to accomplices. Today's episode is about black business economics but more importantly scaling we're really really proud to have an amazing guest wait till i introduce him you're not going to be disappointed my name is thierry lindor i'm your host some of you might know me as an entrepreneur and active citizen but this spells definitely pales in comparison to our guest today who is none other than Franz saint -Elmy. He is somebody that I have tremendous respect for. I would consider a mentor. He's a savvy entrepreneur, also an entrepreneur. We're going to touch on that later. And he's somebody that's had very successful uh, a, a raise in terms of funding, but also an exit, a very, very, very important exit that not a lot of people in Canada know about, but is very, very, uh, I'd say, um, popular and public in Quebec at least in the black ecosystem. Ladies and gentlemen, need to say, this podcast is about to be amazing. We're starting this with a bang today. I'm really proud to have this guest. Beautiful people, bring the volume up. If you're at work, act like you're, act like you're working, but stop working for an hour or so. If you're at the gym, put down the dumbbells because this is going to be interesting. You're going to have a lot of ah-ah uh -uh moments. We're disrupting the status quo in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hey-oh! Africa wasn't afforded some of the same services. Rosie, as Sir George graduate on a master's in Yale, helps organize a computer center I can announce that the government of Canada, in partnership with Canadian banks, is investing nearly $221 million to launch Canada's first ever black entrepreneurship program. Franz saint me how you doing? I'm great. How are you? Hey, hey, because you're here today, I'm blessed, black, and highly favored. <laughs> We're going to jump right into this. For the people that don't know you, if you could give us a description of who you are, for, and as if you're meeting somebody for the first time, who is Franz saint me in 60 seconds? Well, I'm just a, a very curious person who loves technology, who discovered technology really by accident. Mm. Um, and from there, I discovered the power of, of innovation and how innovation could change the life. So since then, since I was 19, I've been using technology and innovation to change my life yep. and also change the life of people around. I consider myself to be a people person, yep. you know, so I am a product of people around me and mm -hmm. also I, I tend to help uh, others around me as well. That's it. That's it. So every guest that comes on this podcast goes through a couple of segments. We're going to have fun today <laughs> and we're going to be together for a while. Thank you for spending the time with us. Our first segment is called 60 sec six questions in 60 seconds. All right. So you could answer in one to two words, max three. No need for explaining why or how. Just answer with short, sen short words, sorry, our sentences. And um, more importantly, if you're not comfortable answering, you just say pass. Sure. All right. So, first question, uh, we're starting right now. What has this pandemic taught you? 
Oh, we're not equal. <laughs> that starts well. Malcolm X or MLK? Oh, Malcolm X. <laughs> I love he said, oh, Malcolm X. <laughs> salty or sweet? Ah, I'm salty. <laughs> Rap or hip hop? Oh, hip hop for sure. Hip hop for sure. What is your cultural background? Uh, Jesus, that's a tough question. I'm a, let's call it the Rat Pack Haitian. <laughs> <laughs> heard that one. <laughs> Rat back Asian. Okay. Nine to five or entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship. Hey. Single or in a couple? Oh, in a couple. Oh, no. Okay. Kids or no kids? Kids. Amazing. And that, those are bonus questions I think we should definitely ask you because they're also very uh, contextually relevant as we're going to see later on. If you were a car, what car would you be? <sighs> Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> we never got that one so far. What is the most challenging part about being a black man? Expectations. Hmm. Never had that one. What is the best part about being a black man? Expectations. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it, love it, love it. So let's jump right into it. All right. According to a recent study that was condoned by the uh, Senate uh, Senators African Canadian Group, uh, in in collaboration also with Senator Deakin's office and Face, we're really proud to have been part of this. <clears throat> It was a survey done across the country that said that three in four black entrepreneurs say it would be difficult for them to access $10,000. What is your first thought when you hear such a data that 75% of black entrepreneurs in Canada say that they could not access $10,000 in financing even if they tried? Well, first thing that comes to my mind is education and the tragedy uh, the of lack of education because ten thousand dollars is relatively small. Yeah, and in the scope of entrepreneurship. In the scope of entrepreneurship, and and on top of that, and I am convinced that most of the people who responded probably drive a car, hmm. probably you know rent or own. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So let's say I rent. I'm yeah. single. I could live with you, yep. share the rent, yep. and save $10,000. Correct. So I find sometimes, you know, it's easy to fall into the trap of not having access. So if money out of the question, so what do you do? What do you think? Yeah. How, how do you survive? And I think sometimes it's easy to blame what we, you know, to focus on what we don't have versus what we could do hmm. if we didn't have money as an obstacle. And so I'm seeing, I'm seeing and hearing solution oriented versus problem absolutely oriented. there will always be problems we're black people come on <laughs> so there will always be problems Rewind. <laughs> what did you just say <laughs> there will always be problems but no black. that's not what you said <laughs> there will always be uh, problems black we're black <laughs> we're people. black people there will always exactly. be problems that's for sure and, yeah. and so the question is you know what do you do about it yeah and so i'm i'm a problem solver yeah and, um, professional problem solver. You know, that's, it's easy for me to, to say that I'm a problem solver because I'm not in everyone's situation. But sometimes I get that question also. People yeah. say, well, you've succeeded. Well, yeah, I come from a family of 13 people. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was raised by a single mother, mother. who had six kids. Thank you. And uh, she was making $3 an hour. So, you so know. You don't give me that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. I wasn't born with that silver or golden spoon, Yeah, yeah. golden spoon. So I, I you know, I'm more of, of the mindset of solving problems. There's roughly $8 billion of equity in, within the black community across Canada, hmm. roughly $8 billion. But that billion dollars is largely passive. And I've heard you say, say this many, many, yep. many, many times. And so, so it's passive because we tend to leave that money with other communities Correct. rather than reinvesting it in, in our, our communities. Own. So 10000 while it's tragic, but it's this lack of education of where to find money. Hmm. Um, I like that. So you're saying it's more about, and, and, and which brings me to my next point. Uh, I always say that there's four key uh, barriers to, to accessing or to, to scaling businesses, at least as black entrepreneurs. It's access to capital access to information, access to mentorship, and access uh, to networks. I'm here access to information. Yeah. How important is it? Because you're an MIT graduate. Sure. Uh, uh, and we're going to get into all the things you've done. We have time. So we're going to touch on that. But um, how 
how would you go about solving what you just described, which is, you know, sometimes we are complacent in the way we look for information, but how would you, let's say anybody listening to us right now, what would be the quickest uh, tip you would give them on solving this access to information problem when it comes to business or entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship? Ask questions. I mean, you know, I'm never afraid to ask a question to anyone. Yeah. And I think you have that same mindset Big as time. well. So the first thing is to ask the question. And then if you don't get the answer you're looking for, ask to another person. Mm. Eventually, you'll get the right person that will give you the answer. There's a ton of data that's accessible. Yeah. There are people that's their job to give you, to, to take that data and turn it into information for you. There you go. So again, that, that's, that you know, self-awareness of if I don't have that information, where, what can I do to get the information? Mm. And so my first instinct is to say, put yourself in a situation or in places where you can get access to the data. I like that. And if you can't get access to it, find someone that will help you turn it. Now, there's, there's lots of data. It can be confusing sometimes. Yeah. With so many services across Canada, and depending on where you live, if you're in Alberta versus in Quebec City, versus, sorry, in Quebec versus in Ontario or Nova Scotia. Yeah. Um, you need to know how to turn data into information. Yeah. Because data can be overwhelming. Exactly. And so I think part of it is, again, short, short answer is surround yourself or, yeah. or find people that can help you make insight out of all that data. And, and you've touched on this before. <clears throat> I've heard you do an amazing keynote, uh, I think in 2015, uh, you touched on being international versus being local. Mm -hmm. That's always stayed with me. Um, how how in our community we often play local. And sure. you you played sport, I played sport, so I could relate to what you're saying. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know, you played very high level soccer. Yeah. Like, did you play on the national team, Canadian, or you? I was on the national. On program. the national program, yeah. exactly. Never played the tournament, but. <laughs> but you were on the in the program. <laughs> on the program so yeah. so you touched on. Uh, taking your skills, comparing it to sports, which I love the analogy, and you touched on having an international kind of vision and envy uh, for, your, for your performance as an entrepreneur instead of local. Yep. Same way as if you place, and I remember, I'll never forget this, you said, I used to, to, to think I was internationally good until I played like the Thierry Henrys and mm -hmm. the guys that were at that level. Can you touch on this and expand for our listeners sure. that did not have the blessing to listen to that keynote? Well, you know, it's one of the things, the best lessons I've, I've learned in life, in my life. I go back to that tournament that I played in Montaterre in France. And, and the whole idea was we, we had the best team in, in the province, <laughs> in actually Quebec in Canada. Canada. <laughs> you know, for three years, three consecutive years, we haven't lost. We, we were destroying everyone. Everybody. So imagine the confidence, the mojo the we had going arrogance. into. Oh, yeah, going into the <laughs> tournament. I mean... You know, so first team we saw, first match was, um, you know, Benfica yep. uh, from, from uh, uh, Portugal yep. playing against uh, um, uh, Not Nottingham Forest, which was at that time in England. A good team. A good team. And so these, these were the youth teams, yep. right? Under yep. 16. Yeah. And so we looked at them. We're like, wow, OK, <laughs> we, you know, we're in great shape. We, we, we are the same height. They're not as bigger than bigger us. you know than us and it looked easy what they were doing was simple, simple. easy <laughs> pass it to the open player <laughs> and move that's it right and so uh you know our first match we played against the local team yeah montater we beat them for nothing it's probably the worst thing that could have happened to us <laughs> <laughs> because it further reinforced, it. you know. It fueled the, 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 the ego. The ego. And then we end up playing our second match. And mind you, these are 25-minute matches. Okay. Okay. So we play against Benfica. And within seven minutes, it was 3 nothing. No. <laughs> what? And we could barely touch the ball. Oh. When we had the ball, it took them literally seconds to get it back. Wow. And they had the ball, it, we had to get it back from our, our net. Correct. So that was the only it way we just, could yeah, get it yeah. back. And really, after reflecting, we lost the game like 7 nothing. Wow. So reflecting back on, on that, you know, it was very simple. We were trained to be the best local team ever. Hmm. 
and the Benfica players, they were selected since they were five years old <laughs> exactly. to become professionals. Correct. And they were trained in an environment that was similar to the uh, first team, Benfica, who was playing Champions That's League it. level in Europe, yeah. who had Portuguese national team players. Correct. Uh, on. So, so these kids were selected across Europe, across Africa, and in Brazil. Correct. And so these were the cream de la, de la creme, creme, you know, coming and put in an environment where their reference was the Champions League. That's it. Our reference was the local league. Yeah. Or the hockey players. You know, and so... <laughs> as far as so, professional goes. So clearly they were, you know, this is, I call it competitive fitness. So yeah. they were groomed or prepared for the highest level, level. since they were five. Yeah. And so we were playing on just on natural ability. Yeah. And natural ability... Doesn't cut it, it anymore. It doesn't cut it anymore. Yeah. So that lesson stuck with me forever. So if you want to be successful at your art, you've got to play international level. Hey. And so you've got to put yourself in, into situations where you're playing against the best. Otherwise, why do the Russians come here? Mm. Why do the Finns come here? Mm. Why do the Czechs come here? Yep. Because... The National Hockey League, Here. the Canadian yep. Junior Hockey League, is the best there is. is. So if you want to be the best, you got to measure yourselves against the best. Hey, love so, it, love it. And I love how you're transitioning this to sport. And I'm also hearing a direct correlation to, 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 to capitalism, but more importantly, to business. Correct. Because since five years old, these, these kids in Europe are being groomed to make money. No question. Right? Yeah. To have a return on exactly. investment for right. these owners, right? So <clears throat> staying in that vein, what would you advise any parent listening to us? Because I'm hearing you talk about your youth, sports. I think I think sports, just like business, is a culture. It is. Like any culture, you gotta plant the seeds, you gotta you gotta water it, and you gotta eventually hopefully reap the fruit of what you've planted and, and, and nurtured. What do you, what would advice would you give to anybody listening that is thinking, <clears throat> I want my kids to be entrepreneurs, to be wealth creators eventually? What advice would you say in terms of the grooming of their kids? I think, first of all, you know, let's, let's be clear. Let's not idolize entrepreneurship because there are doctors, lawyers, of engineers. Course. Great professional you know, trades the, out there. The professors, yeah. you know, that are fantastic at what they do, lecturers. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, so in anything you do, it applies. That same theory applies. Absolutely. If you want to be the best, you got to measure yourself against the best. Yeah. And so your reference has to be high. And I think for children, you know, the best thing we can do to help children is, is basically put them in an environment that challenges them hmm. to strive to see, uh, to do things or to learn to get new things. So simple things, right? You know, traveling with our children, hmm. going places, going to the museum. Yeah. Simple thing, getting out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Making them see other things. You don't need a lot of money for that. Yeah. You just need to inspire the kid to be curious. Yeah. You know, I was fortunate. I was inspired to be curious. Be, be, first of all, I had no choice. At seven years old, I was put on a plane and said, you're going to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> from on your own yeah so <laughs> at seven therefore, you know so you figure shit out yeah i mean you know yep. you but no i choice. think the the best thing you can do for for a kid is is to empower them to learn hmm. and learn as much as from their mistakes as much as much as as from success and i think curiosity nurturing that desire to learn and to do things because being an entrepreneur is to strive for continuous learning. Rewind! <laughs> Being an entrepreneur is... Is to strive for continuous learning. That's it. You know, uh, there are shit you don't know. Yep. Well, you figure it out. Yep. You know? Or um, I call you. Or you call a friend. <laughs> exactly. You I know? text and but, call but, you. <laughs> but, but, but the fact is, you know, you, you will be put into situations as an entrepreneur that, that you've never seen before. Absolutely. You've got to deal with it. Yeah. You, so, so, but your natural ability to learn yeah. and to wanting to, to be better and not, you know, not be defeatist in yeah. front of the first obstacle. Yeah. That's what, it, that's what it's all about. Being an entrepreneur is really about 
you know, doing things. Yeah. And to do things, you have to have that desire yeah. to learn. And I, I, when parents ask me the question, I tell them they should focus on the three C's. And to me, the three C's are curiosity, creativity, and competitiveness. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you give these three things, these gifts, right, encourage your kids to be competitive. Not, not competitive like, uh, like becoming bad losers or sore losers, but just like uh, being comfortable being into a competitive sense because yeah. I think a lot of people aren't and I want to touch on curiosity because I know it's one of your superpowers for sure you're one of the most curious person I know you read a lot of books well that's what I was gonna say you because read a lot you know it's one of those things where today everyone's got a supercomputer in their pockets right think about it hmm. you know when I was growing up I had to go to the library to, yeah. get, to read about yeah. things right yeah. but I can google almost Anything. I, in fact, I don't have to. I have. To, I ask Google verbally, right? <laughs> she you answers know, your or answer. Alexa. Alexa or Siri you know, answers. Or Siri. <laughs> so you know, I we we are fortunate where there's this unlimited access to knowledge, to incredible data. Yeah. Right. You know, and so you know, it, it's one of those things where our kids spend so much time on computers and phones. Yep. Not learning. I mean, they are learning. I, I shouldn't say that because my kids, when they play games, they learn new there tricks is, yeah. and things. Yeah. But, but, you know, being curious about, you know. So he was asking me, you know, what is a politician? Your son has yeah, that? Yeah. yeah. Great he, question. He asked me, he's eight <laughs> years old. He asked me, what is a, a politician? politician? I said, well, you know, it's someone that really represents a, a group of individuals to help make decisions for the group. And he says, okay, like what? <laughs> <laughs> You know, and I love that because course, every answer yeah. came with another question. question. And, that's, and that's, you know, so many times, you know, I've heard this when I was growing up. Well, parce que, because. That is the ultimate Haitian answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Either parce que, because, or yeah. hey, papa. You know, so, but if he had his, he left his, uh, his, his, his phone or iPad in, in the house, but if he had it, I would have challenged him. Go Google Go politician. Google yeah, but right. that's the youth algorithm. That's what I call it with my son. It's their algorithm is always questions, questions. Mm -hmm. Like you answer a question, it layers into, trickles down into another question. But what would you say to, when I'm sure a lot of our audience are, are, are of African descent, Mm -hmm. What would you say to the parents that grew up in an environment where curiosity was not okay for kids? Mm -hmm. I grew up like this. Yeah. I, I wasn't allowed to. If, I, if my father told me something and I asked a question, he would answer me, tu réponds pas. Yeah. Like, don't answer. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And, and it's always, it was mind-boggling to me. Thank God I pushed. I got disciplined for it, but I'm happy that I, I pushed and pushed and pushed. W would you say that maybe our generation needs to also understand and embrace that curiosity from black youth? I think it's quite normal now. Um, it's normalized more yeah, than it used it, to be. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So I, I do feel that, you know, we're so much, we're in such a better place than we've than ever we were. been. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't see this as much of a challenge. Problem anymore. I think the biggest challenge we still have is we stay local. Instead of international. I have so many people that I know that have never left Toronto hmm. for a minute. That have never left Montreal North for yeah. a minute. You know, that don't explore. You know, so when I tell people, look, I'm running a company that's in Quebec City. And they ask me, why? Oh, that's <laughs> where the best opportunity was. And I've done this in Dresden, East Germany. In Germany, yeah. And I will go wherever it might be. Life takes you. You know, yeah. well... Not necessarily. Well, now you went to I Germany. Yeah, for sure. You know, but you know, I make these choices. I think we st we we are so in our shells. We're sequestrated. Yeah, we economically, like uh, comf geographically, comfort. culturally confined. Yep. Yeah. You know, I always give the ex the the the, um, the example of of the party. Hmm. We never like to come first. Expand on that. Think about it, right? When it, when you you go to a party, you're a black person. <laughs> do you want to be the first person or the amongst the first? You arrive when the party's Me, kicking. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get it. I was like, what? So just repeat what you just said. Yeah, we don't like to be first. first that's facts. So, so so we get to the party when the party's you know kicking. We get there late. And so <laughs> I, I put this 
real estate, so you, you know, this is something you speak of. You know, first, I moved into my neighborhood in 2004. Real estate-wise? Yeah. You were the first black man logically. Well, no, probably not, not but, you know, one. when I said to my friends and family, I'm moving all the way to St. Dorothy, Laval. They were like, what? Are you out of your mind? <laughs> I said, yeah, that's the future. You're close to the airport. The yep. new airport now Next is... the 13th. Yep. Yeah. Is Dorval. It's yep. no longer Mirabel. It's yep. Dorval. And I'm literally 15 minutes there. Next to Pharmaceutical Canada yeah. as well. And, and there's a train station that yep. gets me right downtown. downtown. You know, I can go to West Island. I can take the ferry. <laughs> you know, it's a fantastic location. But people were telling me that I was crazy hmm. for going that far. In that neighborhood. In that neighborhood. And so that speaks to comfort zone. That is a good point. You know, so we, we don't like to be first, um, and so we like to stay in our comfort. So wherever there's more black people, that's where, that's we, where go. we go. We gravitate to. Correct. And, and so it's, it's quite natural, and it's true also in business. 100%. So where there's black folks in business, <laughs> we do. You start a, a podcast, there's 50 <laughs> others that start the podcast. This is going to generate a whole lot of po- <laughs> You're so right, because I, I, I started in real estate. When I started in real estate in 2005, four now, sorry, wow, it's been a while, 17, I was the first one. Mm. There was nobody in real estate. There was, I remember there was four, and they were much older than yeah. me. Uh, shout out to Carlos Boiron, actually, who was, was one of my mentors in real estate early on. And uh, now, there are so many black That's folks and Arab, young Arabic. I get so many people DMing me saying, you were, the, you were the person that made it cool to be in that field, yep. and hence why. And the same can be said about the taxi industry. Mm-hmm. We get into that industry, next thing you know, uh, a taxi, uh, the taxi industry became kind of like known as the, in, the Haitian industry Absolutely. in Quebec. Which brings me to my next point. I, I like to say that if we had access to funding, mm-hmm. and I, I want to get to that point, um, Uber could have been, in my opinion, if in the 80s we had like face, if we had you know, access to, to scaling money, um, innovation would have logically came out of the Haitian community in the taxi industry. But because there was no access to funding, I think Uber could have been a Haitian-owned company, right? I would love, I'd love to hear you on this based on the fact that there were so many taxi drivers and so many people in play, implicated in, in the mobility industry. But my generation, I remember used to, be ashamed to say that their father drove a taxi, not even knowing that your father is probably making more cash than a whole lot of people and also has a, has a property that is worth back then 150 to 250,000. You know, this is where I'm, I'm gonna go back to, uh, or I'm gonna step into more roots. Um, I do feel that, you know, first of all, I disagree. Okay, awesome, amazing. <laughs> Second of all, the, the, we were not ready. In terms of? We were not ready to, you know, be in that mindset. And the reason... Innovation being, mindset. In, not just innovation, collaborative. Because hmm. this, is, this is, you know, collaborative business model. Correct. Right? You know, sharing. Peer-to-peer. Peer-to-peer yeah. sharing. Yeah. So, so it, it, it involves so many things. I think... Where we are now at, we are right where we should be. As a black community. Knowing where we are coming from. Got you. The first thing, we're still struggling with that. And that's the one thing that I think, you know, as a collective, we're starting. I think Black Lives Matters helps with that. Yeah. But the first that I can remember was the Nation of Islam. Oh, yeah. To make me love my blackness. Yep. You know, and regardless of the shades of blacks Correct. within our communities and the languages, but to love ourselves, you know, first and foremost. Yep. And then to trust ourselves as communities. Yep. We're still struggling with that. Big time. I, I can he- <laughs> I hear it all the time. English versus French, you know. Haitians, but, but then, Jamaicans. Uh, correct. But then I, I, I hear it also. Well, this is Quebec versus Ontario, right? You know, um, and... and but then if I'm a black Latino, yeah. what do I say? What, exactly. <laughs> you know, so I don't fit in that. Black Arabic yeah, as well. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. It, it, it's one of those things where I think what we need to do is to invest more in 
learning about our cultures and learning to love who we I are agree. and learning to be comfortable with one another yeah. and to trust, trust each, each other. other. We don't have that. And, and, and it's okay that I make mistakes as a businessman Because I don't have generations of business expert expertise in my family. Correct. So I'm learning on, 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 uh, on the fly. On the go. As I'm doing, I'm getting better. But no one gives me the benefit of the doubt. Hmm. So, or it's harder to get benefit of the doubt in our communities. So I think today would have been much easier. And I think in 10 years or 15 years from now, We're gonna see. much easier. I'll give you an example. I was uh, my first year of CJEP or last year of high school when I heard the Fuji's the first time. Amazing. Okay. What a group. And this is, uh, this is coming from a guy who was listening to Compa, Zook Love, you know, all, all the day. time. And my friends were calling me, just come. Because <laughs> I was listening. Just come means you just arrived. Yeah. You just got here. Fresh off the boat. Off the boat. Because I was listening to my culture Yeah. Music, black music, black music. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and so when Wyclef Jean started waving the Haitian flag yep. and started speaking in Creole, rapping it, in Creole, it, de it democratized <laughs> Creole <laughs> for my own Haitian people. Yep. It democratized, and all of a sudden, a lot of them who were shy, who were afraid, they proudly yeah. started to now you know raise that flag. Like. And so you, it, symbolism yeah. is so important. And so now it's much easier. Faith is the product of what the Nation of Islam, the Fujis, yeah. Yeah. And the Black Lives Matter. Yeah. You know, all the, the things that have happened over the last 30, 40 years. Very true. You know, to get us to a point where it's to have a coalition mm -hmm. that is thinking beyond themselves. Yeah. Faith doesn't. You don't own faith. Nope, not at all. But faith is your gift yeah. to your brothers and sisters. Absolutely. Why? Because you love your brothers and sisters. Absolutely. And you trust the people that you've worked with. Absolutely. But that, there's a journey to get to that point. And I'm not saying that we, one individual couldn't have done it mm. in the taxi and be the, the champion. But as a community, Got you. we were not ready. Got you. That, see, put that way, I think, I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, but, but also, <clears throat> I think I think that you're that one person also that is, um, you're that change maker. Like uh, you, you yes, you are a product of all the experiences you've had. But to do the things you've done, working and dealing with Steve Jobs, and and you know I, back when you used to work at it was Micro. What was the company that you were with? Oh, Future. Future. Yep. Future, right? So, so just so you, you guys listen, Francais tell me, athlete, dreams of being a professional athlete, understands the power of innovation, always superpower being curious, obviously superpower being black as well, uh, goes to MIT, studies where you probably were one of the only, definitely one of the only francophone black if anything. That was what year? In what year were you at MIT? In 1999. 1999. Black Francophone man at MIT. You then leave MIT and you go work for a billionaire, I believe. Yeah, Analog Devices, Race Data. Yeah. He actually recruited me. Exactly. So he went to get you, Jewish man, I believe. Yep. Yeah, very, very savvy businessman. Hires you to lead an entire division. You end up traveling the world You end up dealing with the Steve Jobs, the Apples, all of these great leaders. And then what, what because I, I want to take our, our viewers and our listeners throughout this journey. What makes you say to yourself, I could do this? I could do what all these people are doing. You know, one of the first things I learned from Ray, uh, Ray Stata, all he did was, his, his brilliance was recruiting. He's great at human resourcing. He sources human so, talent. So <laughs> essentially, I mean, at the end of that the day, talent. you know, uh, uh, people at the are at the foundation of innovation. Correct. Great things come from, from people. Who, from people. Yeah. And so, so he was across the Northeast. So, I mean, Boston is rich in terms of great schools and yeah. universities, but also, you know, from New York to New Jersey, Philly, you know, the whole Northeast, the whole East Coast, right? the whole Northeast, and. Um, And so he was handpicking 
talent. The best talents. Hmm. Uh, not the ones that had the best grades, because I never had the best grades. Mm -hmm. But but I was probably the most creative and the most, you know... Outside I mean, the box. The hustler, right? Yeah. The, the think different. The yeah. guy, like the can-do attitude. So he was looking for those. And one thing he said to me, he said, look, you know, there's a ton of engineers. But creative problem solvers, there's not that many. There you go. And I look for them. There you go. And so, you know, after... Watching these super successful people work, the recipe is the same. What do you think Steve Jobs does? Mm. What do you, you know, I mean, he made his success off of Steve Wozniak. Correct. Right? He's yeah. a salesman, a great salesman. Fantastic. Fantastic right? salesman. Right? You know, Pixar. Yeah. You know, he knew nothing about. Nothing about the <laughs> animation <laughs> no. and nothing. Yeah. But he was a great. He could make great, a pitch. Uh, he could pitch the hell out of things. Right? You know, well, people know a lot about. Bill Gates, but Stephen Ballmer was exactly. the, the guy that made shit happen. Was the Wozniak? Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So it, it's one of those things when the, the moment, you know, like the the moment, the, the tipping moment, point, you, you know, that I realized that you know I was actually very good at rallying people hmm. around the problem, and and because I was never afraid to ask the people that I thought were better than I was. Yeah, and so you know. And because I always ask the tough questions and also the dumb questions, the, the engineering fellows, the, the super brilliant ones who had, n like, people were afraid to ask them mm. questions because they were so rude, mm. you know? I mean, why are you asking me dumb <laughs> questions? Go research it, Exactly. Right? And so, you know, after doing this for a couple of years, I earned their respect. Correct. And so there was nothing that I couldn't get them to do for me. Yeah. Because they trusted related you. Related to work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so they knew that, it, you know, I would come to them with real problems. Yeah. That would challenge them. Mm -hmm. But also I would do something with the answer. Yeah. And so, so once I figured that out, I figured, okay, this is... You got the recipe. This is it. Yeah. You know, so... And I began to pitch ideas internally on how to solve problems. And I would go to folks like in, internally and then say, could you help me? Would you be supportive of this? And so you started micro projects within the corporation. And, and this is gem for everybody listening to right now. If you're just clocking in, clocking out nine to five, because I lived that as well mm. uh, when I used to work. I worked for uh, Gas Metro for a while before I got into real estate. And I realized that our bosses are not only human, but they're also, at least mine back then, they're looking for innovative outside the box sure. ideas. So when you come up with these ideas and you pitch it to them, eventually they'll take them as their own. I, I went through that, I'm sure you did as well, but more importantly, they wanna eventually bring you in and also let you get some of the credit. I know we're gonna be <laughs> talking about venture cap, Yeah. but I was pitching ideas, but not just ideas. I would also bring solutions. Solutions, concrete solutions. Right. Here's how we get to, to the, the end product. And so that earned me a reputation of someone you could trust with a tough problem. Correct. That would find a solution, solution. and that could implement the solution. Got you. And so that reputation preceded me. Correct. So, you know, look, I... I, I and your value went up. In a big way. So, <laughs> but I, I, I earned it the right way. Correct. So, you know, I founded, I co-founded a business from scratch that generated $380 million when I left. And that generated, you know, 30% EBIT. Oh, we, we, I want to talk about this. So yeah. don't, don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, but, but, but that, that mindset of problem solving yeah. helped me build a business That's within it. a company. Got you. And, and it, think about it. It was a million dollar investment. Oh, sorry. Within the company, sure, yeah. you generated a whole department and a team that generated three hundred eighty million, million dollars of revenue. Okay, so I did not know yeah, the C. Yeah. I didn't know that we one. We made over sixty-seven percent gross margin. Amazing. Thirty percent EBIT. So wow. So think about it. We were gener We were cash Real generating. Cash cowing. Yeah, yeah. And and so that you know, I, I became the youngest general manager in the history of the company. The company. You know, by the time I was 24, hmm. I was managing 400 people who were... And like that was in 19... Them. No, that, So this, this is 2003. Right after this, the dot-com oh, bubble yeah. as well, yeah. the yeah. whole mess. Yeah. You're 24, 20, 24, you said? Yeah. 24, youngest manager, 
making general manager so i was i was running a division which i co-founded amazing uh, from scratch and it was a million dollar investment at that time from the company to build that business and it was pretty simple we were I, i i didn't do anything miraculous so what happened was at that time entertainment you know sound was becoming more digital yeah but it was reserved for studios mm-hmm. and so being an audiophile i said you know wouldn't that be amazing if you had the studio quality hmm. you know from the studio yep. to your home to your car and so I you just got the idea it was went to your team to how, then, how can we do this you know so this engineering fellow <laughs> at this company his name is bob adams he says well If you want to do that, you got to go to the Audio Engineering Society show. It happens once a year <laughs> in the Kravitz Center in New York. Love it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then, you know, every other year it rotates to L.A. And so, uh, and, and so, so we, we went to the Audio Engineering Society show and yeah. spoke to a bunch of audio engineers. Made the contacts. And asked That's it. the question, why is it so difficult to take studio quality, sound quality, yeah. and bring it into the home. And then the answer, after talking to a bunch of people, two things. The first thing is software. Hmm. The second, the microchips that are necessary to do that. And so you need specialty chips yeah. that don't exist. And so if we Th- can... That are not commercialized. That are not commercialized. So they're made only for professional yeah. uh, broadcast that's studio, that's right? It. So these large mixing consoles that you see in Big studios. Big machines, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So to do that, you'd need to have, you know, uh, miniature chips that can actually convert the, the analog world yeah. sound into a digital format. Got you. But then you need the software. Yeah. And who owns the software? It's people like... Microsoft, it's people like <laughs> Dolby Labs, it's people like Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. Mm-hmm. Um, so all these AAC or uh, MP3, yeah. you know, codex. And so it was about just about convincing them that basically you could create a whole new market by enabling people like <laughs> myself who love the professional sound yeah. and to have it in their home. So that was the advent of home home theater systems. Imagine that. And car infotainment. Yeah. So which is huge now. Most cars now come standard with eight eight speakers. <laughs> exactly. Right? Back then They're little studios. it was four speakers yeah, yeah, yeah. or two stereo, That's right? It. You know, so I remember the first success we had was with um, in fact actually I should say I went to all the audio companies that I could find across the world, from the Kenwoods, the Yamahas, the Sonys, the Denons, the Lexington, the, you know, Mark Levinson, mm-hmm. you know, all the big <laughs> brands, the Beckers, you know, and asked them the same question. And it turns out that nobody has ever really thought about, you know, professional sound Imagine. in your car. So the whole, the whole idea of prosumer, yeah. professional consumers, you, you know, the garage... Garage Hero, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. It all stemmed from yeah. a simple idea, taking yeah. from you, the studio to your home, to, to your, your home. car. Yeah. And so our first success in automotive was the S-Class. It was the first car... That you implemented that in, idea. In 2001. Amazing. That had 16 speakers. At that time, was Ooh. unheard of. <laughs> 16 speakers in... And you were part of that project, sure. leading that entire yeah. thing. Yeah. A lot of people... See, that's what I find. Like, sometimes we don't know what we don't know, and we don't know how many innovators there are in Canada. We don't even know... Like, now people are listening to this. Imagine that. The S-Class Mercedes having 16, you know, speakers and having this professional studio sound stems from the idea of a black man that was made fun of for listening to Kampa. <laughs> yeah, see, that's true. No, but, <laughs> right? So, that's so, a good way to so, put it, so yes. I, I think it's amazing that, that we don't know what we don't know, which let's, let's fast forward. Actually, yeah, go ahead. I want to bring it back to what I said earlier. Okay. okay. So I treated my professional career International. as the same way as a professional athlete. That's it. So you said that I went to MIT. Yeah. And the reason why I went to MIT was if I wanted to be an engineer, 
I wanted to play I with Jordan wanted to and Magic Johnson. Challenge myself. Mike Tyson. With, exactly. <laughs> you know, so I, you know, it was, and, and, and how did I get there? I didn't have the money to go to MIT. Hmm. So my bachelor's degree, I did it at Northeastern. And I selected Northeastern University. Northeastern my University. friend went to Northeastern. And the reason Great why school. I went to Northeastern, it's the largest private university in yep. the U.S. 50,000 yep. enrollments. People don't know that. And it's, it's also in a very poor neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, a black neighborhood, Dorchester, yep. you know, in Boston, <laughs> Brighton. Yep. Downtown. You know, yeah. Uh, it's in the middle of... What the, year were you at? Uh, at, uh, at Northeastern. Northeastern, 96, 97. So my friend came in 99, 2000. He was on a full ride scholarship, Lindsay Landu, yeah. So, so what happened was the reason why I went there is they have this program called Co-op. Yeah. Like you have at Sherbrooke, Sherbrooke University. University. So a co-op program, because, uh, you know, you Break can down work. Break down co-op for those. Yeah, exactly. For so so co-op programs is fantastic because, you know, immediately, you know, at, after your second year. And since I was a trans from Ke Quebec, Quebec. I, had, I had two years of CGEP. They credited all pretty all much all your... of the coursework. So I could fast track into the co-op program. Yeah. And I started working for companies like Raytheon, Digital Amazing. Equipment, Wang Computing, While going and to school. Analog Devices. <coughs> and Analog Devices, Ray Stata, who actually uh, uh, recruited me, mm -hmm. put me into this program that that's, uh, is called um, a Fast Track Program, uh, or HIPO. Okay. Um, so basically, this program allowed me to actually go to school but also work at the same time. Yeah. As and if I meet a certain standard, certain grades, the school, the the company would cover cover the, the tuition. Exactly. And I, to me, that's one of the biggest raises <laughs> that are available to black folks that we don't leverage. We never talk about. We also. work. We work for large corporations who have tuition reimbursement programs. Yeah. But we don't take advantage of facts. Them. I did because hmm. that paid for. My Everything. university, and I went to the best schools. And Northeastern ain't cheap. I remember it was like is 25 to 30,000 a semester. Yeah. US. Yeah. Today, US. you, you want to go to Northeastern, that's 50, 60, 70,000 dollars. If you live on campus, yep. that's 70,000 dollars US every, every year. Every year. I remember. I remember <laughs> when he told me this, I was like, nah, you, you're, yeah. you're wrong. And then, and then he told me, no, it's a brand new car. A yeah. very nice car every single year. Every year. And he was yeah. on a full ride. So so you go from Northeastern, you do this co-op uh, program, which fast tracks uh, uh, your, your career. You eventually demonstrate your value. Your value goes up. Then you leave. Yeah. I and left. Then, the main reason why I left, because, you know, think about it. At that time, you know, the, we were doing so well. The next wave of growth for audio and video was content distribution correct so i said to myself imagine you know a car or the home is a bunch of wires to get the speakers connected to get the sound to move from one distribution system yeah, yeah. so i said you know wouldn't it be great if we had over the air Bluetooth. content distribution not 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 even there yet i was saying content distribution over the air so imagine you're in the vehicle you know instead of having you know basically 50 pounds of, of cables. Yeah, of you hardware. May, maybe you have a couple of pounds. Got you. And then sound is distributed over the air. Yeah. And uh, at that time, we had some ideas on how to do this. And so I went to my the same boss and said, hey, can I get you know some additional Fund. funding to go basically explore the idea? And he said, no, we are a hardware company. We make components. We're going to stick to hardware. We're going to stick to <laughs> hardware. So... I said, okay, well, I'm going to quit and go do what this I'm, what on I the think side. Is, yeah. Exactly. And do yeah. this as a, as a business. Yeah. And so that's why I left, you know. And also because, you know, at that time you're so young, you know, you're 25, 26, and you're looking at the next guy who's above you. He's, less, he's not even 50 yet. Mm. He's going nowhere. Mm. And he's not moving. He's not moving. And you also have a seven-year theory that I want yeah. you to expand on for... I'm biased here because because we talk. Uh, touch on that seven year uh, uh, theory regarding like you know moving. Yeah, I mean it's difficult to to get 
any to to create any value it's difficult to in business to create any value below seven years now yeah. it may happen yeah but you know your first couple of years you're exploring Correct. you're learning you're doing things mistaken yeah exactly testing. and then the next two years you're building you're starting to build yeah. and then you know then on your fifth year you're starting to really add real value owning your skill yeah and then once uh, you know once you've reached your seventh year you've demonstrated you know multiple years of success of absolutely consec consecutive success so you have something that is extremely valuable because you have really proven track record. So anyone that's leaving a venture, you know, after f less than five years, you're not really... You didn't give it a real no, shot. No. It's not like in, in hockey where, you know, yeah. <laughs> you can get in, you know, on one year you can win the Stanley Cup. And you then, know, or in basketball, yeah. like Kawhi Leonard. Yeah, you know, Draymond Green. Yeah. Just off of Michigan State, wins exactly. the championship. Next thing you know, it's, it's game it's over. Game over. So it's, it's one of those things where in business, you know, you really, people, no matter how good you are, you cannot change things in less than five years. Yeah. Serious, serious, serious impact. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so I, you know, it, and when people look at your track record, when you say you've done things, and you say you've done things less than three years, you're lying to yourself hmm. because you probably benefited from the work Correct. of someone somebody else. else. And smart money knows that. Hmm. We're going to get to that. That's smart money. So so then you leave the company. You you end up going to Germany. And I'm going to fast track that. No, part. actually, I didn't go to Germany. Not right I came, away? I came here. I came, came back to Montreal, I Quebec. came back to Montreal. Okay. And in Montreal, I came back with the idea, I'm going to write my business plan. Yeah. I've got some cash now that I'm going to start to... Start my own thing. Start my own thing. And then, you know, like literally... Within days, my phone rings. This is an interesting story. Okay, you never told me that yeah. one. <laughs> Within days, I'm learning as my well. this phone is rings. Good. And this, this lady, her name is, she says, my name is Gina Gallardo. I'm <laughs> assistant, executive assistant to Mr. Robert Miller. And so I said, well, the name rings a bell, Robert Huge. Miller. You know, he's the founder of Future Electronics, one of the largest electronics distributors FE, in yep. the world. You know, I mean, very successful. So immediately I'm thinking, this is my opening. <laughs> this is I mean, it. This is godsend, <laughs> right? I mean, this is this is this is the universe working. No question, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm back to Montreal a couple of days, and then Boom. my phone rings. It's Gina Gallardo. I'll never forget that. She says, "Mr. Miller would like to meet with you." And I said, "Sure." Um, so she said, "Okay, let me get come back to you with some times, some slots." And she asked for my email address. She said, "I will send you a couple of of uh, scenarios or options." So within literally a couple of hours later, she comes back and she says, Mr. Miller would like to meet with you Tuesday hmm. at nine. <laughs> we are, we are like really on a Monday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Tuesday is tomorrow and it's not nine in the morning. It's 9 p.m. So I turned around. I said to Vicky at that time, I said, what kind of a Vicky's lunatic? wife. <laughs> I said, what kind of a lunatic would want to meet for the first time in their office Chris? at 9 p.m.? You know, I, I who does that? Who does that, right? <laughs> you know, so, but I said, hey, look, the guy's rich. If I make <laughs> Very him, rich. If I make him like my idea, yeah. like me and my idea, he's probably going to be one of my first investors. investors. And he could take me to another level. And so, anyways, to make a long story short, I end up meeting the man. 2008, 2007? No, 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 2004. 2004, okay. Yeah. So, in, and I end up meeting him, and I see, wow, this man, you know, uh, very humble. You know, even keel. The guy knows a ton about Powerful guy. so many things. But he was so humble. He said, you know, I'm so privileged to be sitting next to you because I've heard so many great things about Franz and Telemi. Hmm. And I said to myself, one day I have to meet him. Now, this is, <laughs> I'm sitting there like little Franz. I haven't done <laughs> shit in my life. This guy is this guy's a huge. billionaire, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he built a multi-billion empire. Yeah. And he's treating me with so much respect. respect. And so he said, look, here's my situation. I spent $300 million in this tiny little company called Cypex. Their products are shit, and I hear you're a superstar. 
you know, about innovating. It, you know, developing new products. So I'd like for you to help me, um, you know, as a small project, um, you know, and I'll no expense, you know, don't worry, don't about, worry expenses. about expenses. You know, I'll take care of all expenses. I'd like for you to meet with the CEO. I'll make all the arrangements. And then you meet, you spend some time, guide him and coach him on products. Mm -hmm. And so on the Thursday, I get on his private jet. I fly to Silicon Valley, San Jose. I arrive in San Jose, spend three days with Walid McGreevy, the CEO of Cypex. And we hit it off. And he's, he's like, well, you know, this is not my area of expertise, but I know how to run a business and I need someone that can help me and guide me on making the right decision. Well, Leeds said that. Yeah. And so what I did was pretty simple. I, it's, just, it's one of my secrets. <laughs> you know, so they were horrible at developing products. Okay, so then how do we turn their biggest weakness into their biggest strengths? Like that. So the thinking was, okay, well, if you're not good at it, why do it? Hmm. And so the guy says, well, we're a semiconductor company. We have to make products. Says who? <laughs> I mean, which book of law says you're a semiconductor company? You, you have, have to, to make this. your own products. Yeah. Why couldn't you find the best design houses in the hey. world and have them work for you. you? You specify the products you want, and you guaranteed to get the product when you want it, it and the way you want it. That's it. It was like a light bulb came up. Ding. It says, yeah, that's a great <laughs> idea. Now, how do we do that? Okay, well, Good job, the Stop next three months, we got on Robert's. And my, meanwhile, my mind is thinking, I'm going to impress the hell out so of So he him. could fund my project. He's going <laughs> to have no He's choice. He's raising funds. To write a, a yeah, fat check. Fat check. He, <laughs> You're my first investor. So... <laughs> And it's an incredible This is lesson. gold story. You never so, told me that yeah, story. So, so for three months, we get on, on his private plane. Robert has two private planes, okay? <laughs> Not one. He has two. It's <laughs> two uh, Falcons from Dassault, okay? For people who don't know, you, you, you hear all these big jumbo yeah, jets and all that shit. Real, real <laughs> private jet aficionados will tell you Dassault makes the, the best, best private <laughs> jets in the world. They're not super big like Boeing. Yeah. You know, they're not, you know, flying boats. Yeah. They're flying jets. jets. Three engines. They can fly up to 60,000 feet. You can go to Montreal, Singapore nonstop. Stop. Wow. That's the quality of planes that yeah, you yeah, have. Yeah, that, that's, that's so, it. So, you know, basically we, we had access to his one of his planes. And so we traveled the world, found, you know, all the best design houses in that's the world. That's it. And then narrowed it down to four design houses. To and then we used the same R&D budget that they had. Instead of doing it internally, we took 80% of that budget and then spread it out to these R&D houses. Love it. And it, the company uh, was on the path to success. For sure. And he was so grateful that after that, he started you know, asking me to help him on other on investments. Other projects. On other projects. <laughs> Moral of the story is, I ended up doing that for seven years as his CTO. Love it. So I built incredible businesses for Robert. Within a, a Within big, future. Big, yeah. You know, the biggest business we built was Future Lighting Solutions. So it was taking basically um, LEDs at that time, which were starting to become big. prevalent. Yeah. And we turned that into a super business we called Future Lighting Solutions. Again, the trick was... How do we democratize solid state lighting? So yeah. Digital lighting for the masses. For the masses. And the way to do that, we opened up 20 design centers across the globe. The design centers was, the, the whole idea was, okay, we develop a design center focus on architectural. Yeah. On landscaping. Yeah. On uh, uh, entertainment. <laughs> Okay, so, so you've broken Ma down into sectors. So you hear the story about Madonna having a, a $2 million stage? Yeah. Oh, that was y'all. Guess what? No, not us. We worked with the stage designer that to was design gotcha. lighting. Gotcha. When you hear the London Bridge is yeah. illuminated, yeah. that's us designing the light gotcha. engines. Gotcha. When you hear Louis Vuitton or Starbucks having their, their signage yeah. light, yeah. right? These are when you see 50,000 light bulbs 
that kind of that that whole design and technology is yours. That's what we enable. Amazing. When you go here, Marriotts, Marriott hotels, turning their light bulbs to from incandescent to LEDs. To LEDs. So when I left, uh, that division generated 1.4 billion dollars. 1.4 billion. For future, yeah. Billy. Yeah, billion. Listen, <laughs> I, 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 we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna stop the first part. I told y'all we needed two part for this. So I want to remind everybody. Stay tuned. In the next episode, we're still going to be with Franz and we're going to touch on raising capital because it's, it's about to go. Uh, if you think we were going fast right now, it's about to go really, really fast. We're taking the highway in the next episode. But I want to remind everybody, this episode is brought to you. So we're going to close up this first part and have the second part. This episode is brought to you by FACE, Federation of African Canadian Economics. FACE is a movement that was created by for, you, for us, by us, literally by black leaders, black innovators that thought about there is a problem, we needed a solution. And the solution was simple. We wanted to solve the access to capital part first and foremost and then move towards access to information, access to, 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 on, um, to mentors and so on and so forth. So this episode was brought to you by FACE. If you are looking for a loan from $10,000, $250,000, check out www.facecoalition.com. Once again, Thank you for the listeners. Thank you for being with us. Make sure you stay tuned for the next episode because we're going to close this up. It's a two-part series right away uh, 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 by telling you that you don't want to miss the next up. We're going to talk about scaling, raising funds. We're going to go for a little bit less, about 30 minutes on the next one, but it's going to be very, very highly valuable. Thank you for being with us and see you on the other side. Hey-oh!